Right, here we go. That's part two of the PowerPoint on carbon cycle and mopping up question seven of the mock exams. Um, agriculture has to change and uh, will have to change and will be changed by um, carbon dioxide levels and nitrogen levels and methane levels. So have a look at the next few slides that all go around agricultural practices uh, that are being implemented or being found again old practices that are being re used nowadays. Um, the summary of that is on page 87, so go for that. And one of the first ones is literally how do you maintain good soil quality? It's, it's no secret, if you've got good soil, you will grow a high crop yield and therefore the expense in carbon dioxide used for farm machinery will be used more efficiently, more effectively. If you don't have a lot of uh, carbon dioxide wasted in respiration unnecessarily in the wrong place, but actually in the right places, then um, you have got overall more efficient uh, crop production. Um, the main practices that are being reused, that they are not new. They're not new at all, but for a while got forgotten about. The first thing, tillage, if you look at the stubble that can be left behind, not only do you reduce erosion both by wind and by water if you're leaving the rooting system still in place, as the stubble decomposes, um, and yes, it will decompose wherever you put it, but at least here it decomposes and the leftover uh, nutrients, so the nitrates go back into the soil, um, which obviously then extra nitrates in the soil, your plants grow bigger, grow, grow better. The next one is cover cropping. Um, you have heard of rhizobium as part of the nitrogen cycle, and we looked at the symbiotic relationship between the legume plants like clover and those bacteria already. So that is nothing new, adding nitrate to the soil as well as reducing again wind blown and water uh, caused erosion because they have got a rooting system as well and more nitrogen in the soil. The last one, and that has been done for many hundreds of years, so crop rotation is not a new one. Um, crop rotation main idea is that if one crop is pro crop is particularly hungry for let's say potassium from the soil and one crop is particularly hungry for um, phosphorus from the soil that at least you're not depleting the soil completely by using the same crop over and over but but actually rotating it a bit now cattle farming is a key one but mainly from the angle of belching and methane produced um, by burps more than farts, farts as well, but here we go, but the belching is kind of a, a bigger one, to do with the requirement of those bacteria that are needed to digest the cell walls of plants, bacteria that we don't have in our digestive system. However, um, there's no easy way around this. It is uh, internationally recommended that we reduce our dairy, uh, dairy and meat intake, particularly from cattle, uh, compared to other animals like lamb or uh, goats or chicken, they are most um, greenhouse gas producing overall and also most water hungry, so fresh water um, also is kind of a bit of a problem there. Uh, we can reduce the methane production in the stomach a little bit, in well in the second stomach, uh, by feeding a diet that reduces those methane producing bacteria, so something that high, it's high in oats and um, rapeseed, anything that's got a high sugar content versus fiber content. Then the next one, rice farming. You're not going to be able to do rice farming without having a phase where your field is flooded. That's the nature of rice and it grows in a flooded field, particularly during the first phases. However, if you've got a rice plant that is a bit more tolerant to drought, that you can maybe drain the fields a bit earlier than you would have and reduce the phase where stagnant water causes methane uh, producing bacteria to uh, live and thrive in that water. Also, and that is a cost aspect sadly as well, so if you've got a poorer country growing rice and rice paddies, they're not going to want to spend extra money on ammonium sulfate to uh, change the microbiome that is living there just to have a bit less methane produced, but it is an option, it is something to consider. Um, drainage ditches, I'm pretty sure you've seen them in places, has got a double effect. On one side, nitric oxide, all those nitrogen oxides being emitted from uh, waterlogged stagnant soil, they are, nitrogen oxides are very toxic, uh, sorry, very potent greenhouse gases. Some, there's a number in the textbook, how many times more than carbon dioxide is, it's something like 96, I think, 90 something. A very potent greenhouse gas, so reducing that is a good idea. So waterlogged soils are a no-go, how do you get rid of it? Drainage dish by the side and a bit of gravity will help pull that water to the side. The 
other nice side effect, if it's less waterlogged, you will have fewer pseudosomonas or those other anaerobes that are actually denitrifying the soil. Uh, another possibility is that you could use salt tolerant and drought tolerant crops. Um, there are potato varieties, I know in uh, Holland, sort of Dutch are practicing with those potato varieties particularly, as to what you could use on, on salt marshes to literally grow and uh, irrigate crops as you would do in a normal field if it's occasionally flooded. Um, so rising sea levels and the spray of salty water that's being blown in from the sea if you've got a field that's close to the shore um, might be an idea to get more of a crop yield by using particular varieties that are tolerant to salt. And also if you've got weather pattern changes um, that include higher drought phases or longer drought phases, it may be a good idea for many countries to come away from industrially produced high yield varieties, which might actually just dry out on you and die and therefore not much high yield at all, but to go back to the local drought resistant tolerant crops and grasses that used to grow there beforehand. In Kenya that's being done very successfully, so they have reintroduced older varieties rather than buying in expensive crops from abroad. Um, they are reusing their own and it, it works. Uh, now for completeness sake only, the carbon footprint list that you've got on page 87, to me it all looks like common sense as in it makes no point in flying food halfway around the earth to process it there and then fly it another halfway around the earth to get it to somewhere, to reduce transport costs, to reduce farm machinery crop because all the um, farm machinery is on fields if possible because that all produces carbon dioxide. Have a, just a quick look at it and see what arguments could potentially go into some answers. It all looks very common sense to me. Okay, now I'm um, going on to that ocean acidification boundary part of what will be question seven. So, ocean acidification is technically one of those boundaries we have not yet crossed, even though locally we have got a huge impact. In a nutshell, you've got a lower pH, more acidity, more carbon dioxide dissolving, more carbonic acid means that you've got a lower acidity. That leaches the calcium carbonate out of shells, mollusks, corals, and literally coral bleaching. I've got a picture of coral bleaching. That's a picture of the Great Barrier Reef across the years and the damage that it has done, that coral bleaching. Um, fish are vulnerable too. Gills get damaged. So if you've got wild fish um, that are free to move and go extinct, sadly, um, they might migrate somewhere else or they might just go extinct because their ecosystem, their food parts as well, will go damaged from the acidity. Um, but literally, if their gills are damaged, oxygen absorption won't happen. If you're doing fish farming, you might want to change the species or the fish variety to something that is a bit more resistant or resilient to higher, um, higher acidity levels, so lower pHs in ocean water. Um, <clears throat> the compound... Carbonic acid, HCO3, is one you will meet again, like I said earlier. And the benefit of the oceans, actually, ha the oceans have done us a huge advantage over the many years that we have pumped carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. It's a huge reservoir. The ocean is vast, so it can absorb more carbon dioxide for a long time. It has absorbed a lot of carbon dioxide before it caused global warming. So there was a lag between the start of carbon uh, of fossil fuel burning and actually temperature increases to, to start becoming noted. The next thing, the water is also, physically, it's just a huge body of water. And water as such has got a very high heat capacity. So changing, we've done that much earlier when we discussed water, changing one kilogram of water by one degree requires an awful lot of energy. So what is actually a pretty big atmospheric increase will cause the oceans to rise a very, very small amount to kind of offset that increase in temperature. Okay, pretty graph, nothing else, just you might be confronted with graphs like this. How do you make sense of those correlations, as in what increases where? The most interesting thing I found about this graph is that, yep, yet again, they have taken all those measurements in Hawaii. Um, main reason for this is you're away from much of the industrial world as you can be in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So you can get atmospheric and water levels of pH that would be globally a bit more representable. Plus it's nicely inhabitable and you've got um, quite a decent scientific community over there as well. 
Okay, now last but not least, now let me move now that we can see the entire question, if that's possible. Uh, before long, you're going to get your mock exams back. I just wanted to throw that question and the mark scheme at you as well. Since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, 250 years ago, look at the graph, where were you about 1850? That's roughly where we're starting, 250 years ago. Carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere have risen from there to there. Okay, it gives you numbers, it gives you a whole lot of comparison, it gives you information in a graph um, about the temperature changes and carbon dioxide levels, and then very unseemingly does it give you at the bottom a couple of sentences, three sentences that give you all the nine marks if you read that part correctly. Use your knowledge, actually let me blast that up right away. Use your knowledge of the carbon cycle, so your background on the carbon cycle, all the keywords that are involved in the carbon cycle. Where do humans interfere? How have humans affected the carbon cycle? Already fossil fuel burning should be the first thing that pops up in your head right now. The how have humans affected the global carbon dioxide levels and temperature levels? So how does carbon dioxide lead to temperature changes? So explain the... Um, greenhouse gases and the trapping of heat. Then, use the information and the data provided. Use the information, give us some numbers, give us some information from that to support your answer. So, say what you know about the Industrial Revolution. When did it start? It tells you that. What changed? What levels have changed? Describe the effects. That's the next thing. You need to describe the effects, and mainly, yes, on carbon dioxide levels and global, uh, and global temperatures. We'll need to use the word increase somewhere. But you also need to use it on aquatic environments. The whole ocean acidification, that planetary boundary needs to be mentioned in your answer. And here we go is the mark scheme. Let's see that you can see that decently. Um, you will have the PowerPoint uploaded separately anyway. So go through it. Go back to that where you've got the what does it actually ask from you and how does it structure that question already? How does it structure it? And if you look at it, you have got... The structure in it, you have got the carbon cycle. So literally, what does happen? What is the carbon cycle? How do humans interfere with the carbon cycle? The second part, the use the data part. Have a look at it. Use the data. First part there, second part, use the data. And the last one was the effects on the aquatic environment. It does structure it for you in the question already. And it is practice. It is practice to read those questions over and over again to kind of think, right, what will my mark scheme say? Seeing a little bit through the examiners, trying to figure out what do they want from you? What do they want you to be able to show? So, um, yep, if you did enjoy that video, um, I would like to say give it a like or something, whatever they say on all the other videos, but I'm quite happy if you did. Bye.